Thank you, Glenn. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll introduce our panelists first. Um, Glenn Chaffetz, soon to be retired from CIA. Uh, our panelists are General Bank Svensson, the defense attache at the Swedish Embassy to the United States, uh, a graduate of so many places, uh, Carlsberg Army Academy, the U.S. Army Command and Staff, General Staff College, NATO Defense College, U.S. Command and General Staff College. We have Dr. Jakob Griegel, Associate Professor at the Catholic University of America, and a former Senior Advisor to the Secretary of State in the Office of Policy Planning in the State Department working on European affairs. And we have Dr. Hans Benendijk, who is a Distinguished Fellow at the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, adjunct political scientist at the RAND Corporation, previously at Policy Planning and the NSC and many other places. So thank you all for being here and talking about uh, Dr. Hooker's paper. What we'll do is we'll start uh, with a few questions that will go to all the panelists. Then we will open it up to the audience to ask both the first panelists, if they remain here, questions uh, about their answers and their viewpoints, and then to our current panelists, if that works for everybody. So the first panel uh, focused mainly uh, on military developments, the military question how a conflict would unfold, what it would mean, how the fighting would look. I think what we'd like to do here is focus on a broader question about uh, the politics, the psychology, and the region. So I'd like to start off uh, by looking at some of the many uh, assumptions uh, that the paper put forward about how the problem is actually scoped, how different actors in the region see the problem, and what the implications for what those differences in perception might mean. So uh, why don't we go left to right? Uh, Hans, you wanna start? Okay, sure. Uh, first, let me just again say it's a pleasure, Rich, to be here with you. To, I've read your paper several times now and for the great work that you did. So the question, really is how might uh, a conflict unfold? What are the assumptions? Uh, Kaliningrad is a big part of that. And you had asked about that earlier. Um, I guess the first thing I'd say is that uh, NATO, NATO's current deterrent strategy is not deterrence by denial. Uh, I think uh, Rich's thinking, I think, moves us more in that direction. But NATO's thinking is really deterrence uh, by assured response. And if you think about it, it's sort of the way we managed Berlin during the Cold War. Uh, we couldn't deny the Soviets uh, the ability to overrun Berlin, uh, but it was very clear that uh, if they tried it, we would reinforce there was a lot behind those very few tanks that we had sitting there uh, by Checkpoint Charlie. Uh, now, uh, over the last four or five years, the Alliance has done a great deal uh, to put some shape to this notion of deterrence uh, by assured uh, response. Um, the uh, strengthening of the NATO response force, the creation of the VJTF, uh, the battle groups, the four battle groups that have been deployed, um, the readiness initiative, the four times 30 readiness initiative, uh, the uh, mobility initiative, command and control changes. So this is all designed uh, to enhance the ability of the alliance to move forward quickly, hopefully in 30 days or less. These are all plans. Uh, a lot of this stuff hasn't taken place yet, but at least there's agreement uh, to go forward with these things. And that will, I believe, strengthen deterrence significantly, as I think Rich, in his earlier comment, agrees with that. Um, then there's a problem. And this is one of the big assumptions that you asked about. And that is, if the, the plan is to reinforce, say, the Baltic states, 
uh, you've got Kaliningrad sort of standing in the way uh, with a capability to interdict those reinforcing uh, forces. And what do you do about that? Uh, do you just overrun it? Uh, this is part of Russian sovereign territory. My guess is that if we got to that point, the Russians would say, do that, and there'll be a nuclear response. Um, and that creates a problem, because NATO has just not thought through what to do under those circumstances. NATO does not have a nuclear doctrine today. Um, it, I would argue that the very limited uh, nuclear forces that uh, uh, NATO has there, uh, the gravity bombs, the uh, DCA to deliver them, probably could do the job to deter. The problem is not so much what we've got there, it's how we think about it. Now, are we prepared to make a decision quickly and to articulate it enough publicly so that the Russians don't have the mistaken belief that they can proceed uh, with a nuclear bluff uh, and divide the alliance in half. That's exactly the sort of nightmare strategy that uh, Sakir has been thinking about over the last four or five years. So we need a new nuclear doctrine in the alliance. And I'll be glad to tell you what I think that is if we have more time. My turn? Same question. Uh, well, let me start, you know, everybody has said it, but I'm gonna repeat it. I wanna thank Rich for the paper. Um, you know, we always talk about commitment of the alliance. If we can multiply a rich into thousands of rich hookers, <laughs> the commitment of alliance will be, you know, probably strengthened. And there's nobody more committed than rich, actually, to the Baltics, which I think it's, it's quite uh, something to be applauded and, and praised. And one of the things that, you know, on, on this issue that I think uh, the paper seems to me does a great job is that one of the arguments that is out there um, that we should not do much in the Baltics is because the Baltics are indefensible. And I think Rich does a great job, as I understand it, from, to analyze the details of it, why actually that's not the case. The Baltics are defensible. And here are the things in the paper that he presents as ought to be done to increase the, the ability of the Baltics to defend themselves and the, of the alliance to actually defend the, these, um, these countries. And I think that's actually a very needed argument because even in the government, the argument often is, let's not do much because uh, it might be a lost cause when this stuff starts flying. And again, I think that's, that's wrong and I think Rich does a great job. On how to do it, again, I'm not an expert and you know, everything I learned, I learned from Rich. So I'm not an expert in, in the details of it, but it seems to me one of the argument, larger argument that Rich is making, I think is worthwhile is, you're correct, is we don't have a deterrence by denial, but we should probably think about it and more so, we should think about the deterrence by denial with local forces, with a great role of local forces. So it's not just us being present there, but what can the locals, the Baltics in this particular case, do to increase that deterrence by denial? And one of the argument is obviously there are tactical operational considerations in this which are you know, beyond my pay grade, but there's actually a political consideration in here is that um, if the locals are unable to show that they're willing to incur costs and they're willing to expend resources, willing including to have larger manpower, the alliance may not only be incapable of getting there for a whole set of tactical reasons, but actually may be unwilling. And I think you know that in the paper sometimes it's lost in, in the, in the tech, important technical detail, but I think that seems to be a key argument. And related to that see, it is the fact that as I read the paper and I listen to discussion, this is gonna be mostly a land warfare. I know that you're army, so go army, but, and, and you know, there is that. But we may be able to open a window in the bubble, we may not, but at the end of the day, this seems to be mostly land warfare uh, situation. That brings in, again, political will of the local ally to a much greater level or greater importance than otherwise, because they're the ones, that's the territory that's gonna be fought, and they're the ones that are gonna incur, incur the first and ultimately, you know, the most cost of this. If they're un unwilling to do that, and they're relying on sort of the hopes of high technology, high warfare in the air or maritime, I'm not sure the political will is gonna be supported by this. So I think it's, it's important that we actually start looking at 
again, determined by the now of the locals. It doesn't mean that the locals are doing it by themselves, and we can talk about it later. No, no, no. But no. no, we're not abandoning them. But without their um, ability <coughs> to stand up for X amount of time, and we can justify the uh, X amount of time according to maybe operational needs. But that said, there is a political component in that that I think is, is absolutely necessary. So let me end that and then continue. General, uh, do you have any views on uh, this perception question, this, this, uh, how the different actors see the, uh, uh, the situation unfolding? And I would include the uh, non-NATO members uh, as well as Russia and the NATO members. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, from a military standpoint, I have, I have several views and I will, I will get to those. But first of all, thank you so much, Richard. Uh, fantastic, a fantastic discussion we've had. And for us, the, the, the countries in the neighborhood that are represented here, the Baltic states and Poland and, and, and the others, it's extremely important that this discussion occurs in Washington, <coughs> D.C. It's maybe more important <coughs> than the paper, sorry, but it is really, really important that this, uh, this discussion occurs. And, and uh, um, it's easy to forget and it's easy to, to, to lose it among every, everything else that's happening. Uh, there's no secret that there is different viewpoints on, on the challenge of Russia within the European Union and NATO. And it's a product of history and geography. The closer you get, the more, the more vocal you are. And my country is, is one of the most vocal in this aspect, together with Poland, I believe. Um, and and we, we view the challenge from Russia as, as, as a, uh, I mean, Russia is the only country in Europe so far that has uh, changed borders with violence. Um, which, is, which is for a European a fundamental change. Hasn't happened since the 1945, and that's why we fought all those wars and all of that. We perceive that this, this challenge is uh, long term, so it's going to stay for us for uh, quite some time. But we, maybe we perceive it a little bit different than, than, than some others, because uh, I think it's very difficult to only look at the Baltic Sea and think that you can contain the conflict there and solve the problem there. Uh, there, is, there is indications that, the, that Russia looks at the whole, the whole front, if you want, from the Arctic, the Baltic Sea, <coughs> the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, and the Middle East as, an, as a front of opportunity. And given that Russia probably don't have the cap capability to start two, two occasions or two events, along the whole front. They can at least trick the West that they're starting something in the Black Sea, and then the real thing is happening in the Baltic Sea. And we talked about command control and NATO and all that. You can imagine if you have two, two to choose from, uh, what that will do to the decision-making process. So I think it's very, very important to have that, have that in mind. This is a problem set that is very, very different from the Cold War War. And it affects my country, because during the Cold War, the main effort, the main conflict, the main war was supposed, for good reasons, to happen in Central Europe. And Northern Europe, and to a certain extent Southern Europe, was a flank, a periphery, and would only be involved basically if they couldn't sort it out in, in the middle. Now, it's most probable that the Northern, the Baltic area, and the Arctic may be the main, main conflict area. It, it contains vital interest for Russia. A lot of its trades go through the Baltic Sea, as, as described in the paper. This is not the Cold, Cold War coming back. This is another situation that is much more complicated. And finally, I would say also that, and we discussed this with Richard, I, I think it's uh, the, warn, the pre warning that, that, that the paper assumes is most likely too optimistic. Because if you look at the last three incidents, and how good we have been in the West to uh, see them in time and take actions. And I'm thinking of Georgia, Ukraine, and Syria. It doesn't really, doesn't really support the idea, let's put it that way. So I'll, I'll end there. OK, so uh, all of you mentioned at one point in your answers this, this question of political will. So I'd like to uh, spin that out a little bit more. Um, uh, Obviously, it's not going to be unified. We're not even going to have a unified perception of when the conflict starts or what the threat is. What's the political will of the United States to defend 
of the Baltics? What's the political will, let alone the difficulties of putting, <clears throat> of putting uh, troops there? Article 5 doesn't say that the United States has to put troops in the Baltics in order to meet its obligations. But that has real consequences and real differences from not having troops bleeding on that soil. What do you think the likelihood is of that, and what are its consequences? Yeah. So the question is political will yeah. in the United States and in Europe. Uh, and so first let me say that uh, the Swedes and the Finns, while they're not allies on paper, the political will uh, on the part of these two countries to move forward with the alliance, with the United States, I, I can't, we don't have better allies, uh, paper allies. So uh, <laughs> uh, that's right, just don't tell them. <laughs> No, I, 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 I do think, I've visited both of these countries very recently, and the mindset there, the willingness to uh, participate and exercise is tremendous. So political will. Um, first of all, we've heard in the last panel uh, that uh, much uh, of Europe has been shaken by Trump's uh, attitude towards NATO, it's obsolete, his uh, uh, questioning of Article 5. Um, you also have in Europe, uh, look at pupils. Uh, in most countries, it's only a plurality that says, we'll go to war to defend an ally. Uh, so there is kind of a weakness in both places in terms of will. Now, that is looking forward, um, but it, it doesn't you know, account for what would happen should war actually take place. That then suddenly changes the equation. We saw that with Pearl Harbor. So um, I think I wouldn't discount it. Uh, I think there's some things we can do to deal with it. We've already taken a big step with the battle groups. Uh, we have, what, 15 or so flags in these, in these various battle groups. Uh, if the Russians uh, moved um, militarily into the Baltic states, um, there would be a lot of casualties in a lot of, from a lot of NATO countries. Uh, there is one missing. That's the United States. Uh, we have four to 5,000 troops deployed in Poland. We have almost nothing. We have a couple of special forces, a couple of other, a little bit of air, but very, very little in the Baltic states. Uh, that um, was not the case earlier. We had a, a company, an army company deployed in all, one each in, in the three Baltic states before the battle groups went in. Uh, I've traveled through all three of the Baltic states uh, in the last couple of years. And um, they're very reassured by the battle groups. These battle groups are integrated into local brigades. Uh, they're, they're more than a speed bump, but they are not enough to deny. So you ask leaders in all three of these countries, uh, what is the single thing that we could do to enhance deterrence? And they say, American boots on the ground. Um, and I think we ought to be thinking a little bit about how you do that. It just doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean brigades. Uh, the, the Russians uh, are going to really pause before they start killing Americans. Uh, that is much more than a tripwire. Um, so what can we put in? Uh, soft forces. Soft uh, are flexible, uh, and uh, they would be extremely useful in dealing with little green men. Andrew, you've been dealing with this. You, you know uh, how useful American soft could be in dealing with that threat. Uh, one could envision some air defense. Um, one could envision a bit of uh, uh, intelligence, uh, surveillance intelligence and reconnaissance capability. Um, so what we ought to be thinking about, what is a reasonable package? Uh, it doesn't have to be a lot. And there are command and control issues. The reason the Army didn't like, as you know, Rich, the Army didn't like having those companies in there is because you have individual companies spread out. There was no command structure. The question was, how do they relate to, to the rest of the command structure? We had to have to, we had to work through those issues and figure out what it is that we can do to deploy some American forces uh, into this area that actually makes a difference, especially in the early days of the fight. Um, okay, so the question is on political will. Uh, let me break it down into three. One is U.S. political will. Second is European or ally political will. Th third is the Baltic 
political will. The first one seems to me U.S. political will is tied, among other things, to two things. One is how do we perceive our allies, whether they're willing to actually step up and care about their own security. And that's not related to Trump, right? Every Secretary of Defense goes back to NATO and his last trip and say, well, we're not going to be dying just for you if you are not doing X, Y, and Z. And, you know, I've heard this 10 years ago from academics and policymakers. And Trump, okay, is phrasing in a different way, a little bit more lively and shorter on tweets. But um, it's, there's a recurrence here sentiments that we cannot care about their security more than we do. The second thing that, that you know, affects our political will is Europe is one of the many theaters in which we are involved. So if something happens in Asia, no matter, no matter what our political will is in Europe, we may not be able to do much. Um, and that it's not necessarily political will, it's just a reality of, of events as they may develop. Second is the political will of allies, and particularly European allies, there's always been a difference in how they assess threats, right? Italy versus Estonia. We'll always see the world in a different ways. The solution to that usually was U.S. leadership, right? That we kind of managed to, to create some sort of common sense and, and shape them into, into thinking about, um, you know, the threats in, in a more organized way. Um, but I think, you know, the other one is, again, I go back to the local level, is that the local countries have to show that they care about this and they are interested in bringing other allies into it. It's, we cannot be the only ones to sort of play interference or, or, or we can be the leaders, absolutely. We should be present there, present there, absolutely. But I think the locals have to show the, the other allies that actually they care about this in ways uh, that uh, are much more visible. Which means, leads me to the third point, political will of the locals. Um, the term is bad and is often criticized, but I want the Baltics to be nationalistic. I want it, them to care and show that they really care about their nation, they're proud of it, and they're going to incur and are willing to incur costs when the time comes against the <coughs> Russians to defend it. Um, usually we aso associate the terms nationalism with, with bad, you know, bad connotations, and there are risks with that. But if you want to convey political will, you have to convey the political will that, yes, this is a nation, whether it's Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, that is worth defending. And, you know, people are not going to defend European Union, to be honest. They're going to defend their own nation. Um, and here, you know, I don't know what our role in this is, but I think in some countries, at least, on the eastern frontier, there seem to be sort of a re revitalization of that sense of national pride and national prestige and honor. And I think that has, a, that has a positive impact on showing political will, which is essential for deterrence. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It, it's, for us, I think it's, it's the, the, the military situation that has fundamentally changed, that have, have uh, affected the, the political will and, and the will of the population, obviously. Uh, and the realization that, that we got more or less surprised of, of that the situation changed so much. Uh, so we're now behind the power curve, and, and we, need to, we need to retake what we once had. And for us, it's done in, in basically two, two ways. First, we are investing in in increasing our operational readiness and, and effect. Uh, and uh, we hope that, and we, I know we will have uh, substantially increased uh, budgets, uh, both for a first period to 2025 and then hopefully continuing of, after that. Uh, that hasn't happened since uh, in my military career, and it's quite long. Um, the second pillar is, of course, international cooperation. Uh, and it's, it's uh, not only policy and political, it's also practical military cooperation. And, um, and it's two nations that are prioritized. It's Finland, uh, with whom we have a very, very close military cooperation with. And, okay, of course, the United States and, in extension, also NATO, where we are an, an, a preferred partner, so to say. And this is, this is done uh, in openly. Uh, and it's reflected in uh, documents and white papers. It's also effect, reflected in our open military doctrine, which states very clearly that alone we can only avoid to lose. If we want to be part of the winning team or the winning, we have to have help. It's clearly stated in our military doctrine. So, so for us, it's, it's, it's a... It's not only a question of will, it's also an intellectual thing, I think. 
I won't say anything about the uh, United States and the will, but I will leave you with this. My belief is that, that the United States has always been in Europe for its own interests, not because they love the Balts or the Swedes or the Poles. You have been there for your own interests. Okay. And? Um, well, <laughs> I'm not going to say anymore. That's up to you to define, not me. So if we, if we have a, uh, a common perception of the threat, uh, and we agree on that, and we, uh, we take uh, Rich's suggestions about how we should be structured and what actions we should take uh, to defer and prepare to defend in the case of an agreed upon definition of aggression, um, what would be the consequences in terms of provoking Russia? Do we all agree on that? Do all the members agree on that? Well, uh, first of all, I'm not sure I share the conclusion that we all agree on the common if, threat. If, if. I, we, I think the, if. you know, when it comes time to writing NATO if. summit documents, we can articulate a common threat. Uh, if you dig underneath that at all, you'll find that uh, every, almost every nation has a different perception of the threat, uh, which is a problem. Um, provoking Russia. Um, well, I mean, they're the ones who've been doing the provoking so far, and I would say that almost anything we do, uh, they will say uh, it's offensive, it's provoking, it's whatever. Uh, that doesn't mean you can do anything you want. Uh, uh, I actually think you know, Rich's thinking has been evolving as I've watched it here over the last year or two, and I think that the focus on having uh, the Baltic states uh, enhance their own capabilities, and they're actually they're a lot better than people think they are, but more has to be done. Uh, I think that's probably the right way to go, combined with um, some ground forces from the United States, as I indicated. I think air power is actually very important uh, to the whole deterrent strategy. Uh, the air power is the one thing that we can get there quickly and we can sustain it. Uh, that is an extremely powerful deterrent. Um, so then the question is, is there anything, uh, Rich, I was thinking about your, your comments. Um, on uh, excess defense articles, and I think that right on the mark. I spent, early in my career, I spent time working on arms sales, and I think I may have actually written the excess defense article legislation um, when I was on the Hill. This is a very flexible instrument. We can provide uh, excess defense equipment to other nations very cheaply, uh, and the authorities are all there to do it. Uh, so perhaps we could cut some kind of a deal uh, if the United States were still able to do this kind of thing uh, with the Baltic states, whereby we provide them with significant excess defense articles in exchange for commitment on their part to use them and to build their forces around that. Uh, so I think there is there is a way the United States could stimulate uh, the Baltic states to do exactly where you're suggesting that they should go. Uh, but I think it's, we gotta start that in the United States. I don't think they're gonna come to us and say, you know, give us this or that. We gotta go to them and say, here's a deal to be had. We think this is roughly what your force structure should look like. This is the equipment you, we, you could have. You do the people, the training, we will provide you with as much of the, the military equipment as we can. Uh, provoking Russians. Um, and that wouldn't provoke Russians. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I don't care about provoking Russians. I mean, I, I have to be honest. Uh, I mean, Russia has not been provoked by us to invade Georgia or Ukraine. It has been invited in many ways uh, to invade those countries by the perceived weakness and isolation of those countries. So, you know, the provocation is not what we do, it's the provocation what we don't do. And if we don't arm or we don't strengthen the deterrence posture, that's, I think, is a provocation. Uh, again, doesn't mean that we should do anything and everything, but I, I'm, 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 I don't fear, you know, perception of strength. I fear perception of weakness, and I think, and, and I'm fully on board with uh, with the argument uh, that Rich presents in this paper, which I think is along these lines. Weakness is a source of instability mm -hmm. because it invites Russia. So, you know, the provocation is not uh, because we would put troops in 
in, uh, in the Baltics or a base in Poland or, you know, give them 60 tanks or whatever the, 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 the things may be. So ultimately deterrence, if we're talking about deterrence, is based on the perception of strength and the will that we're going to inflict cost on the enemy, right? And then if we're not willing to do that, then deterrence is not working. Yes, and the other side will, of course, sell it as, oh my gosh, Americans are, you know, a bunch of college, drunk college kids that are provoking us and, you know, flexing their muscles. Russians will always complain. Uh, but we have to be willing to show that we have the capability and the ally has the capability of shooting Russians. Simple as that. So, yeah, I just uh, wanted to uh, put it in a slightly different way. Um, I don't think... I'm worried about provoking the Russians either. What I'm worried about is taking steps that divide the alliance. And there are a number of allies uh, that are very sensitive to not provoking the Russians. So whatever we do. And that's the point. Whatever we did. So it's not about provoking the Russians. I don't think, you know, they're, I don't think they're going to be able to increase their defense budget by a great deal. They're so constrained economically. Uh, but it's keeping the alliance together. That's the core of all of this. And so as we go forward uh, with these kinds of plans, we have to do it in a way where we have alliance consensus. Uh, and I don't think Rich's suggestions are far off the mark from where we could reach a, a consensus. Um, I mean, in, in principle, I agree with, with provoking Russia that, that we shouldn't let them de determine what's provoked, what provocation is. However, I, for us living close by, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Because you could actually be the, you could meet the result of the provocation. So it is, it is increasingly, it is important to have communication with, with Russia. Uh, it's, com it's, it's important to think before you do anything, obviously. Uh, I will leave it at that. With deterrence, I, I think that, that Air was mentioned here. I agree with that. I think it's very, very important. And also with naval assets. The Baltic Sea is, you can use the Baltic Sea in many ways. It is not, it's not the most dangerous sea in the, in the world. You can use it, the, despite the, the bubble and everything like that. So those two aspects need to be considered too. So let's take that issue of, of consensus. Um, and, I, and I think you know, you, you, you raised the very point that, that we were trying to get to the heart of, which is um, one person's provocation is another person's reasonable action. Um, and when you're dealing with so many different alliance members who are all trying to uh, respond in a timely manner um, and even agree on what the nature of the threat is, um, I see that um, making difficulties for, for what you're pointing out, Hans, of keeping the alliance together. It keeps coming back to these different perceptions, but so it, is the degree of consensus necessary in order to to do what what Rich suggests? Is does that exist? Is that is that no. feasible in NATO today? Is that is that changing in a way that makes it more or less feasible over time? How do you see that playing out? Um, you know, in, in, if it if it is providing equipment to the Baltic states, which is, I think, one of the main recommendations that I take away from uh, Rich's paper, uh, that's something we do in the United States. That should not be seen as provocative, uh, even by nations in the southern part mm -hmm. of the alliance who, by and large, don't really care about the Russian threat or don't see it as a threat. Uh, so I think we can take a lot of steps within the existing broad consensus. Um, what I would say, though, is that uh, over the last five years, uh, things have really gotten bad with Russia. We're in a downward spiral. And um, I, uh, I kind of look back. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the Harmel Report, 1967. You know, uh, the, <laughs> the alliance at that time, <laughs> the alliance at that time uh, was in a very similar situation. Uh, we were shifting strategies to, uh, from massive retaliation to flexible response. There were a lot of questions about whether this is going to be aggressive. Will we provoke the Russians? Uh, and it took a group of experts uh, to um, 
work through these problems, and they came up with a very simple strategy, deterrence and detente. You work on two tracks. We've kind of drifted away from that a little bit, uh, and, and we've drifted away from it um, because of Crimea, for good reasons, because of interference in our elections, uh, et cetera. But I think we need to start thinking about how you have a balanced relationship with this other power. It, it can't be all uh, on the military uh, track. You've got to, there are arms control issues, there are some other areas where we have common interests. Uh, we just have gotten off that track altogether. So I think that would be a good way to try to regain broad alliance consensus about where we're going with Russia. Um, I don't disagree. Um, I, I think that's that's correct. I, I would just mention one thing, though, that sometimes alliance solidarity is used as a tool to do nothing. And, um, you know, obviously we want both alliance solidarity and deterrence, uh, but sometimes the two don't go hand in hand, in my view. And I'm not sure, so far it seems to me we often are willing to sacrifice certain moves that would increase deterrence because we're afraid as some allies will tell us that they're opposed to, whether it's moving bases, whether it's putting certain troops in a particular location, whether it's uh, selling certain things to allies or partners. Um, um, and, you know, uh, we have to take, uh, uh, we have to exercise prudential judgment as the U.S. whether we want to, you know, bow to the fears that alliance solidarity will, um, you know, not collapse, but we will have become more fragile. Uh, versus the fears that deterrence is not, um, certain requirements of deterrence or Im Im imposing costs on Russia are not satisfied. And that's true in the military realm, but it's also true in terms of first and sanctions or arming the Ukrainians. Not every European ally was thrilled about this or is thrilled about this. Nonetheless, we did it. We said, okay, fine, we are allies, we like solidarity, but this is something that we decide and it's, it's worthwhile. Um, the, the risk that, you know, alliance solidarity may require more meetings and greater conversations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I, I like alliance, alliance solidarity, but I like also military deterrence on the ground. And, and sometimes the two clash. I, I would only say that, 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 that uh, I, think we, I think we are maybe looking at it from a slightly slightly different perspective. We, in, in Europe, we are very fortunate because in contrast to many other areas in, in the world, we do have the structures to show solidarity. We have, the, we have NATO, we have the European Union, we have a, a, some other organizations that actually gives us the possibility to be, to be part of, of something whole and actually do this. And the sanctions are one, and also the discussion within NATO is, is another. So the tools are actually there. What I'd like to do is give you uh, each uh, one, Can I get the and and then audience? we'll then we'll get the audience in. If you want to do it? Was there anything that that you didn't get to say? Well, I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Okay. I think we can All maintain right. alliance solidarity and deter at the same time. All We're right. smart about it. <laughs> Glenn, do we want to allow questions to the? Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. And I'll, I'll use my role as uh, I just, uh, I had a two finger while ago for Hans. Uh, when you go to the Baltic states and talk about the issue of tanks, it, many of the Baltic militaries are just, they do not even want to discuss this issue. And, and they, because it starts the conversation about logistics. Mm -hmm. Well, we need tow missiles, we need, you know, javelins, but, you know, yep. tanks, we can't handle that. And, and so your point is spot on about the, um, about the excess inventory, you know, if we designated it and gave it to them, but they are really paranoid uh, about this issue. But let me be fair to Estonia. Estonia's uh, defense budget and planning, I think it was 2023, they have allocated funding for developing tank forces. So I, I just want to point that out. And uh, Well, there, there are two reasons they tend to uh, discount the importance of tanks. One is they don't have them. Uh, and the other is the terrain. Uh, it's not, you know, trying to get from, uh, get, get to the, uh, the Baltic states. There's just a lot of bad terrain, swamps and lakes and things. So it's not great tank terrain. On the other hand, I'm sure if, if they could get a bunch of um, uh, M1A1s, they would figure out what to do with them. Uh, so I, and I, but it's not number one on their list. They do put anti-tank high on their list. 
air defenses up top. That's what they want. <coughs> so, so this comes up a lot, and uh, there are still some in the room, and earlier there were more of my Baltic colleagues, and we've had extended conversations going back at least the last three years on exactly this topic, both when I was in government and out of government. So sometimes the people you're talking to, though, d don't, don't have a military background, and then other times they may have a military background, but they have no background with heavy forces or, or with or with tanks. So, but those of us who do have a military background, I think understand pretty clearly that while there are lots of ways that you can cope with enemy heavy forces, the best way to deal with Russian tanks is with tanks. It's just not open to discussion. And I say this as a, as a soldier who served in anti-tank units for years. And I'm pretty familiar with the technology and pretty familiar with it, the tactics and how they're employed. So that's number one. Um, the Baltics as bad take country. I can promise you the Russians are coming in tanks. Whatever you may think of the terrain, the Russians are coming in tanks, just as they did in 1944. The Germans actually uh, defended the Baltic states for the better part of a year in the last year of the war and felt it necessary to have an entire Panzer Corps of, of, of tanks as part of that defending force even given the threat they were under in all the other places on the Eastern Front, right? So they understood that their ability to defend successfully was dependent in large measure on having an armored force of their own. And by the way, the terrain either being good or bad for tank warfare, uh, these German tanks helped them to hold out till the end of the war. So when the war ended in April of 19, or early May of 1945, 700,000, uh, German and local forces were still defending. They had been cut off, but they were still defending successfully. And so their defense only ended with the signing of the, of the end of the war treaty there. So uh, I 100% acknowledge that this is going to be a big stretch and a large step for countries that don't have any tradition or experience or knowledge of this kind of warfare, which doesn't mean that it wouldn't be very, very helpful. And the last thing I would uh, say on this matter is that there's a full understanding that you can't just have a ship pull up and unload 100 tanks and sail away. <laughs> we're talking about training. We're talking about spare parts. We're talking about funding. We're talking about sustained security assistance over a significant period of time, uh, which is a reasonable question to ask when this proposal is put forward, and one that the United States and the rest of NATO, were we to go down this road, would have to be willing to, uh, willing to embrace. I agree. Um, so again, another question for me. I'm a Fulbright Schooler here at uh, John Hopkins University. Uh, two things. Uh, one is uh, uh, Dr. Grigal. Uh, I do not work for the Latvian government, <coughs> but it's uh, <coughs> difficult to share the view that it's, it's, it's not good with the political bill. Because of course, there are issues, especially in Latvia with procurements. You know, it's quite difficult you now when we have around 600 million euros, the, the defense budget, but it's, you know, there are many issues, but I think the countries are really striving, you know, to do things uh, to, to um, have the will and also the cap uh, capabilities. But the question is that I have, a, uh, what from your perspective should be done by the Baltic states? So there are 2%, uh, you know, things are so say, rolling. So what would be seen from Washington DC as, you know, as more sufficient will uh, at the political and societal level. So should we go for 2.5 or, or whatever? So it still, still wouldn't be you know, quite much. So that's one question. And the second is to uh, Dr. Binedik. Uh, you talked uh, quite well about the presence of allies in the Baltics. So we have like uh, three battalions in each of the Baltic countries. And we also have the Americans rotating recently uh, a uh, uh, Abrams tanks and Bradleys came into Riga port to be transported to Lithuania and the uh, entire battalion is going to fly uh, in Lithuania. So, so things are happening, but the rotational is, you know, it's, it's not permanent. Sometimes, uh, you know, 
uh, so to say, um, unstable things are more permanent than, than, than the permanent ones. But what should happen uh, uh, for NATO and US especially to establish permanent boots on the ground? Because uh, this is the second year, so second anniversary of the enhanced forward presence was celebrated uh, in June. Uh, and Canadians last year, Trudeau came to Riga and promised that uh, Canada is here at, at least for 2023. And as we heard the earlier today uh, from, um, from the report that uh, indeed Russians have quite a high threshold for pain, so they can wait maybe 10 years and we are back in pre-Crimea situation. So, so two questions uh, to, to put in a nutshell. So what the Baltic states should be doing more to, to show the will and the, the second is on the permanent boots of the ground. Is it realistic and what should happen for that to happen? Thank you. Um, good question. I think, you know, Rich, you, you mentioned in the paper the issue of manpower. I can't remember from the top of my head, but you probably do. What the Baltic should do in terms of manpower, how much they can actually should do, how much they did in the past, and you can mention the name. But I think that is actually key. There are military reasons for that, but to me, actually, not being sort of a military planner, to me, it's the political thing. It shows that there's a national will, and then there's a will actually of the state and the nation to mobilize its population for that defense. And, you know, I, I'm, that's why I think, you know, there's a risk of saying, well, there's technological solutions to these. I think the ultimate solution is manpower and the demonstration of the will of the nation to do it. And you can't do, the, the best way to do it is through large number of, of manpower. And, you know, in the, in, the, in the paper, Rich, you go through how you do it and what's, what the numbers are. Again, I don't remember in the top of my head, but I fully agree on that for political purposes, first and foremost. And you go through the military reason. For me, it's the political effect of that. So with regard to uh, potential American presence in the Baltic states, I don't think the numbers have to be large. Um, I think, you know, anywhere north of a company would probably do it. it. It's what's important is what they do there. Again, I think soft is extremely important. Some air defense is important. Some intelligence reconnaissance is important. Uh, the word permanent, we ought to just take out of the vocabulary uh, for a while, persistent. We saw this, I just worked on the, uh, uh, the uh, deployments in Poland, and uh, they wanted a permanent, you know, Fort Trump there. And it's just not the way uh, our Defense Department is thinking now. Uh, they, they want agility. They want a dynamic force. They don't want to plunk people down for long periods of time. You don't have to do that. Uh, you can do it in a persistent way. You can have at any point in time uh, roughly that number of troops there. In fact, it's better for training. It's better all the way around to, to do it that way. So I'd take permanent out of the vocabulary. The other thing I think I could, I would suggest to uh, strengthen the overall posture there is more prepositioning uh, of heavy equipment. Um, trying to get that stuff into these countries during time of conflict is really difficult. Get it there early, um, and um, and put it in you know hardened positions. But I think that would be a very useful um, expenditure. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, Bob Nurek, Atlantic Council. Um, this has been a very interesting, I think, useful discussion. I'd like to make two observations, if I could. The first is, um, uh, as useful as this has been, I'm a little bit concerned about one thing, and that is um, I hope we don't, uh, I, uh, don't substitute one myth for another one. I'm very glad on the one hand that the people have wanted to demolish the myth that the Baltic states are inherently indefensible. We've got to get rid of it. I'd be, un I'd be unhappy if we encouraged the notion that the Balts aren't doing anything themselves. In fact, they're doing quite a bit. Um, can they do more? Yes. Uh, we all know it. Um, uh, Hans and I were part of a working group which looked at this, but they've, the, the Estonia never went below 2% in recent, in recent years. The others did, but are increasing it. They are, are increasing the, their forces. There are a lot more exercises now than there were before, more serious exercises. Uh, and to use, it's a cliche, but in all three countries, there's more serious attention to so-called resilience, which by which I mean what, civ what civilians can and should do. Uh, 
again, um, they, they can, they, they, there's more they can do. There's certainly, in addition, more that the West and especially the U.S. should help them do. Um, but they have a much better case than I think has always been evident. And um, so I wouldn't want to encourage the notion that they, ha they haven't been serious themselves. They have. Uh, second observation about um, the question of political will. I think we need to distinguish, we need to break this down a little bit. It's political will by whom to do what, under what circumstances. I'll just use the US case. Um, uh, on, start with the circumstances. I get, I'm sure this is true of every American in this room, ever since 2014 I've been asked about um, what from, by East Europeans about uh, what to expect with respect to the sustainability of American engagement in NATO's East. And my answer has basically then been that day, the day-to-day -day engagement, I'll explain why I say that in a moment, I got much more confident um, after a couple months than I was at the beginning, for example, of the Trump administration. I said this for a couple of reasons. One was the other people in the administration, a very strong bipartisan consensus in the Congress about this. Uh, so it's not that, that things couldn't change, but there would be big political costs to do it. I say day by day because what was less clear and remains unfortunately less clear to me is what, uh, uh, well, I should ask, uh, ask, ask one other factor, which is frankly, the more I listened to him, the more I became persuaded that with the, expect, with the exception of the burden sharing issue, uh, Trump didn't care that much about NATO, and that was actually a good thing because he left it to a lot of other people, um, you know, serious uh, senior officials to, to handle things. Um, what I was less certain about is an, an event of a really se severe crisis where he had to make a decision. I didn't know what he'd do. Uh, I'd like to say otherwise, but I don't. And what worries me, it's less in the case of a, 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 you know, an, ap an, abs uh, an actual invasion, that is war started. I think, it, again, I don't want to, I, I can't predict the future, but I think it'd be ho very hard for any president to sit back if there were an actual obvious invasion of the Baltic states. What worries me more is about a severe crisis where it's not, you know, conflict hasn't broken out, and inevitably people will worry about uh, how to manage this. Um, any country would do it, including, including a U.S. president. Uh, and it's one reason why um, I'd like to see a lot more politically engaged exercises in NATO so that some of the issues, not that people are going to make commitments in advance, but that some of these issues about what, about what to do in a crisis where it's not clear what's going on exactly, it could, be, could get better, it could, it could get worse, uh, that political leaders are confronted with the kinds of choices they have to make. Uh, two great points, Bob. Uh, I, Bob is one of the few people in this room who uh, probably remembers the Harmel Report back in 1967. <laughs> um, so I think Rich's report uh, does do justice to uh, what the Baltic states have done so far. You talk about the 11 battalions and the artillery right. battalion. So you, you list there what they have done uh, and I think uh, you're, what you're trying to do is build on that existing capability. I've visited um, um, brigades in both Latvia and, and Lithuania, and they, they are serious. Uh, they uh, know what they're going to do in time of crisis, and um, that doesn't mean you can't improve and We should improve on it. They need to improve on it. But you're right, Bob. We shouldn't under, undercut that. On the second point about... Uh, will in the United States. Uh, you know, I've never seen more support for NATO on Capitol Hill than today. Uh, I think we probably all remember uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg's uh, talk last year to, um, or was it this year? It was this year, earlier this year, to, uh, to the Joint Session of Congress. Uh, I mean, he had more standing ovations uh, during that talk than I can remember in most other uh, presentations to joint session of Congress. So it's a great deal of support there. Uh, the uh, Chicago Council on Global Affairs does an annual public opinion poll, and they put forward a question uh, which asks uh, the American 
the Americans polled, do you support an exist this existing level or a larger level of support for the, the alliance? 75% of the American people support American support for the alliance where it is or stronger. So that's, a, you know, in, in a country that is presumably supposed to be retrenching, that's an amazing statement of support for our alliance. So uh, I think we've got the will. Uh, I think the, the key issue is the one Bob put, in time of crisis, what does our leadership do? And just to add to that, I, I completely agree with that. Um, one thing that worries me is that uh, obviously nobody in town now is pro-Russian, right? And, and well, there's some, but they're hidden. Um, you know, everybody's anti-Russian, but mostly not because of the analysis of this strategic situation, but because for domestic political purposes. And that worries me that you know, once the domestic political situation changes one way or another, some of that unity will disappear, not necessarily for NATO, but at least as, as a threat assessment against Russia, which then will may have consequences. But I'll take it as it is, which is an occasion actually to uh, push for some of the, 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 the points that, that Rich was making. There's, it's, it's a window of opportunity that we can use now to, to strengthen the deterrence. Um, one more thing of political will, though. Um, it seems to me, you know, especially when you talk about um, deterrence or and then in potential moments of crisis versus a clear attack. I think a lot of it will depend on how the local frontline ally defines it. And and um, yes, our leadership matters. But you know, if there's the the, you know, the 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 quintessential Russian threat, the little green man, and the local ally doesn't define it as anything more than just a small crisis, well, we don't we are not going to force it upon them. To, to call an attack. If they, however, define it as an attack, then we will have to sort of not necessarily agree with it, but we'll have to consider it. So my point is, again, that local allies have a lot to say in how they define the particular situation. And, and um, giving them capabilities, which is Rich's point, and then we can debate which ones, how many tanks and what, but giving them capabilities allows them actually to be much more blunt in their definition of potential crisis as attacks and vice versa, and responding to them quite clearly. Uh, yeah, I think it's one of the one of the differences to compare to the Cold War is that uh, I think it's manifested in that question is that that we used to be able, uh, for us who not only read that report but also are Cold War warriors, we used to have a pretty good picture of what the Soviet Union was objectives, methods, and all of that. We, we had right. a pretty good end. And it turned out after the wall fell and we could actually read some of the papers that we were quite, quite correct. Today, it's much, much more difficult in a given situation to define the objectives, the methods, and the resources that will be used. And that in combination, obviously, with, with, with we, we normally don't use the hybrid grayson. We use the nonlinear. Uh, which is, which is uh, I think, is, is how the, the Russians define it, which is a much more fluid situation with not phases, where the different, different methods of the dime um, is used in different ways to, to achieve effects. And that is, is, is means that the whole, com the whole problem is much more <coughs> difficult to define, and hence it's more difficult to get the political decision. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I mean... Before we had to plan for what we knew or thought we knew they'd come crashing through the folded gap, correct? And now we don't know where it's going to be. We don't know how it's going to be done. Um, we don't know a lot, and that makes planning, I think, infinitely more difficult, which means the consensus is, is more difficult because you have to consider so many more uh, possibilities. Um, and, and it's wonderful that you laid out uh, in the paper, the, the most likely scenario, but people have to consider other scenarios as well, and they, they have to agree on those in order to make the kind of suggestions that you put forward more real, Glenn. Yes, uh, my question is for General Svensson. Uh, I don't want you to feel ignored. Uh, is there, um, in the October proceedings, uh, there was an, a very interesting article uh, called Unminding Gap uh, by a gentleman that was, it was a very interesting article about the GIUK gap and NATO strategy and planning in regard to Russia's change of priorities in naval warfare uh, 
uh, more to falling back on the bastions in the Arctic uh, through the technological advances of the use of the caliber cruise missiles that basically he was arguing that Russia would fall back in the bastions and use the bastions uh, as a way to attack NATO port facilities in the Baltic and prevent U.S. reinforcements from coming across the Atlantic. Um, it's a very interesting idea, and one can always look and see how they would use the calibers. There's been a, a certain buildup by Russia in the Arctic. Uh, so your, my question for you, from your perspective as Sweden is a neutral country, but you're seeing all this going on, uh, and obviously Sweden has its concerns, and Norway has created a, a rapid deployment force to deploy uh, in Finnmark, uh, which is very vulnerable to a Russian attack. So what, what's the perception from, uh, from your part of the world in terms of how you see Russia's strategy and how this connection with the Baltic, which is so important to Sweden, how do you perceive that? Um, Alan. Thank you so much, and it gives me a fantastic opportunity to, to to, uh, to say that we are not neutral any longer. We are non-aligned. <laughs> it used to be the case that the policy was that we were non-aligned, <coughs> aiming to neutrality in war. And neutrality in war is, 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 is a term defined by international law. In our case, we have left that since the mid-90s, I believe. Early 90s. Early 90s, thank you, Magnus. <laughs> and, uh, and now we are non-aligned, and then we have, have uh, our, so our declaration of solidarity that we will act if any members of the European Union and so forth is attacked. So our policy is completely different. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. Um, uh, I, I can't answer you specifically on what they will do and what they will, uh, but I can answer you in more general terms that First of all, uh, because I, I feel in, implied in your question is that the Baltic Sea and the Baltic Straits are, are basically, that's Russian territory. And it's too dang dangerous to go in there. It is not. We operate within the bubble every day. In the air, on the surface, and under the surface. Uh, it's one of the most, most uh, hectic and traffic heavy uh, sea lanes in the world. And it's very, very difficult to perceive that they just could cut that off because that would be, uh, have immense consequences on, on the Russian economy. So what I would ask is a more nuanced and more uh, analytic approach to naval warfare in the Baltic Sea. Now, when I speak to the, to the U.S. Navy, and my, my good colleague, the Naval Attaché, does, he, he often, often comes to that, uh, that attitude and that conclusion. It is increasingly, and it's very difficult to have naval assets and to use naval assets in the Baltic Sea. You yeah. have to have special, basically, special ships, especially basic, uh, special submarines to do it. You have to have experience to do it. The neighboring states the coastal states in the Baltic Sea, we know how to do it. So ask us and we will help you. Rich, did you want to say a final word? Wrap up? Yeah. Um, I did want to defend myself in one respect. <laughs> <laughs> which is that it's true that the paper goes into much greater detail about land warfare, but I draw your attention to several places in the text which highlight the point that at the end of the day, um, in time of, of actual conflict with, with the Russian Federation, air power is going to be the decisive factor mm -hmm. here. It's the great advantage that NATO enjoys in, in terms of the forces that can rapidly be brought to bear. It's by far the strongest arm of the service, so to speak. Our technology overmatch is probably greater and for sure is greater in the air than it is on the ground. Um, these forces can move rapidly and so on and so on and so on. Um, and it enables us to offset other real advantages that the <coughs> Russians have developed while we've been distracted by the global war on terrorism uh, for the last 20 years or so. Um, but again, I'd stress the point that, that none of that matters if we can't solve the problem of Kaliningrad. Because if you don't, you can't fly. And if you can't fly, you can't win. <laughs>
So um, I'm aware of all the arguments against touching sovereign Russian territory. I'm aware of all the um, inherent uh, difficulties in urban warfare and trying to solve that problem from the ground. Uh, I'm aware of how difficult it will be to solve the problem <coughs> from the air. But as uh, my good friend Jeff Hanna was telling me during the break, sometimes uh, problems are so hard to think about that we just sort of decide we're not going to think about them and, and that they're not solvable. This is a solvable problem, uh, but it's going to have to be solved to bring NATO air power to bear. And we're probably in pretty good shape if we can make that happen. And we're, we're probably not going to be successful if we can. I did want to add a comment on the issue that Hans brought up uh, rightly about uh, NATO's nuclear posture. It's certainly uh, probable that uh, at some time in this scenario that's been described here today, the, the Russian government will threaten the use of nuclear weapons. It's a big advantage that they have to bear. And if we think about it for a moment, uh, Russian aggression is unlikely unless they question NATO confidence and NATO resolve and NATO cohesion. And if they've made an assumption that, that, that those factors are somewhat weak, then their assessment is also likely that uh, we will run before the threat, of the threat of a nuclear exchange. Would the Russians actually employ nuclear weapons in this kind of localized scenario that we're talking about? I think that's a very different question. Right? Why, why is that a different question? Well, first of all, if you're going to threaten the use of nuclear weapons, um, you're risking nuclear escalation. Nuclear, uh, NATO is a nuclear alliance. It doesn't have its, its policies very straight right now, but it does have nuclear capabilities, no, no doubt about it. Um, Russian planners and Putin himself can't just assume that if he were to employ a tactical nuclear weapon, the nuclear powers are going to run away or capitulate. He can't assume that. Nor can he assume that he could control um, nuclear escalation along that continuum. And, and why is that? Because nobody's ever done it before. This was the reason that, that the nuclear regime was so stable during the Cold War. I, I submit it's a reason why the nuclear regime remains stable today. So we would need strong nerves, as I say in the paper. We have to be prepared for that eventuality. But if we, if we fold our tent every time the Russians wave uh, nuclear weapons in our face, as they do every day, by the way, with their escalate to de-escalate doctrine, well, then the game, is, the game is over. And we all hope and pray, and I think, think that the game is not over, and that NATO, uh, uh, with some, some changes and some improvements, can still be a viable and successful alliance going forward on into the future. So thanks very much. <laughs> well, I want to thank everyone for Friday afternoon and taking time to come out. And I think it's been a great discussion. And, uh, and I want to thank Rich for putting this all together and uh, putting his thoughts into the paper. And, and I truly hope we can meet again and continue this discussion another time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.